Um, so it's our last day. Wow. I'm really happy that people have stayed with us this long because I'm surprised that the room is still fill, full and the discussions have been really great. So I'm really excited to show a little bit of what we're doing in the tar sands, um, kind of a response to a lot of the problems that we're dealing with. So this is the Lubicon community-based solar project that we just put up last summer. Next slide, please. Um, quick, from the community, small community, isolated community, community that's been impacted by oil and gas for 30 years, just like a lot of our communities in this room. Next slide. Tar sands, so we're in the Peace River region, so just um, east of Peace River. Next slide. Um, some of the stuff we're dealing with, which I know a lot of people deal with, so there's Little Buffalo where all my family lives, and uh, 200, 206,000 oil and gas wells, already 1,400 square kilometers of oil sands, um, and also potential nuclear development. So 70% of our territory has already been leased out to industry, not at our consent. Next slide. Um, some of the stuff that we've dealt with, I know other people in the room, but massive oil spills, um, which has been, this is one of the biggest ones in Alberta, so 4.5 million liters, 28,000 barrels in 2011, so a lot of our families were cleaning this up. Um, yeah, the next slide shows, this is actually, we took this from the air. So those little white people are in hazmat suits. Um, so that's actually the muskeg, the muskeg trapped all the oil. Next slide, please. The company said that they cleaned up, but this is what we found next year, 15 months later after the cleanup. So some of the concerns that were, next slide. Some of the concerns, concerns we're dealing with is the water, as you know, the Peace Athabasca Delta, sixth of Canada's fresh water supply is being threatened. Next slide. And you can see because of climate change and the change in climate, um, these are the issues that we're dealing with. And next slide. And the boreal forest, which is because of climate change we're, we're talking about today, is um, when the boreal forest is uprooted, and you know, Canada's now number one in deforestation across the world, so that means that we've surpassed the Amazon um, because of the tar sands, because of projects like this. And we see the woodland caribou, a lot of the habitat. Um, you know, by this, by 2040, they'll be extirpated or completely extinct from our territories. Um, so I know a lot of communities are dealing with this, so I'm going to go into some of the, the positive things. Um, so next slide. Um, so what I'm really looking for after about a decade of doing this type of organizing and just trying to stop this type of expansion from happening is because of the man behind me. I was really inspired by the project that he did in his community five years ago, and I wanted to do the same. So from an Indigenous perspective, I think a lot of us in this room think that, you know, solar renewables is a lot more in line with our Indigenous ways of being and thinking in the world, so, as opposed to fossil fuel extraction. So looking at returning to zero waste communities. And next slide. So the Sioux First Nation, this was the coolest thing because I love your administration building and there's the chief, chief planes on, on his um, installation, big administration building, but they now... This is so cool. They rent out the cars to community members and their um, electric cars. So this is pretty, pretty cool. I saw that last year. Um, so this is one of the youth from our community. So we brought in uh, 80 panels, so a 20.8 kilowatt system we put in. So which is actually one of the biggest in northern Alberta and, and actually in Canada because it's a, it's a top of pole mount system, which is really different than from the ground mounted systems that we see. Um, in a lot of the pictures that we've seen, and we, the reason why we put it up, similar to what Minona was talking about, is we put it about 20 feet in the air, because we didn't, it's right beside the school, and it's right beside the community center, and we didn't want the kids being, you know, these slides, they look like slides, they're real shiny, so we are like, okay, high voltage, you know, we don't want to see any kids get electrocuted, so we put them real high up, and so that was something that they told us that we couldn't do, so we worked with a friend that was an electrical, electrical engine, uh, mechanical engineer, and he helped us design this, this system. So there's the first day the solar panels arrived in the community, 26, 260 watts, so that's Carlton, one of the youth that worked with us, putting it up from start to finish. So you can see here um, the solar panels coming in um, and just putting them up on this system. I'm gonna show you a quick um, video after to try to bring you back to the community, because I can talk a bit about it, but I think seeing the community is really cool too. But this is all the youth that we worked with um, from the age of 18 till, you know, in their 40s, men and a lot of the men would come in from the community, but we worked specifically with like about five, six youth every day from like 6 a.m. sometimes or 8 a.m. till like 9. Um, so they were on with us every day, so you can see them putting up the panels here. Once we got the, the rows up, we, we put the panels on top, so we had, you know, a lot of people helping. And so that's the final result. So you can see the community school right behind, and then the health center, which is connected to the grid, is um, right beside. And so it's a new health center that's finally brought in, so it's really cool that it's powering the health center too in the community. And then next slide, so this is the launch. 
where we got the kids who are going to be there going to see these solar panels, you know, until they're adults. Going to be, they're, they last, you know, have a warranty for about 25 years, but they can last up to 50. So, you know, these youth that were there putting their handprints in, these are the base of the solar um, panels, is that they're going to they're gonna be there until they're 50, you know. So we have, that's the ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, and also wanted to recognize my dad who's in the crowd who, you know, believed in this project and said, yeah, we want to see this happen in our community. We want to see this transition in. So, you know, um, we went, we did a community um, meeting where we asked the community if they were, you know, if they wanted to see solar panels in the community and they said yes. So it took us about a year to fundraise for it. Um, so it wasn't, you know, just overnight. Um, as I'm gonna say, there's no solar ferry. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of hard work, but it's worth it. Because every day these, the, the children in the school are gonna see these solar panels every day and know that it's, you know, from the sun. This energy's from the sun, as opposed to raping and pillaging Mother Earth. Um, some of the challenges, um, especially building in the north, there's a lot of them, but logistical challenges, it's more expensive. Um, you have to be prepared. A lot of the tools and all of the stuff, the solar project, the solar equipment is coming hundreds, you know, a lot of kilometers away. Um, there's less local expertise, so that we had to bring in some master electricians, but they're actually from Edmonton, so, but, you know, 10 hour drive there and back. Um, but the benefits were community members got trained and um, they're ready for the next one. And um, I think one of the major things is just making sure that you have the master electrician, um, the solar engineer, installers, all the people that you need to make those applications so you can actually connect to the grid if you're going to do a grid connection. And that's in Alberta, is the microgeneration application. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to say too is that, you know, as per usual, Indigenous peoples are always at the end, you know, we're always underfunded. We always get the, you know, the last things, you know, in, in this society anyways. But I really hope that we can see a just transition to renewables. Um, and that's a part of what I really want to see. And this needs to happen in our communities now, you know, not at the end of the day where we wait. Um, and before I show the, um, the film, which is a short four minute film, um, I just actually wanted to, um, what Alvin said earlier, I wanted to, you know, bring in what we have violence against the land and we have violence against our women, and those two are in inextricably linked. And I think that's something, something that a lot of us recognize. I know that there's probably more people in this room than just me and my family that have, next slide, have experienced violence against you know, family members where you know, my sister's case is still unsolved, listed as suspicious. You know, we don't know what happened to her two and a half years later. Um, and I know that there's, that's just something that I want to bring in because I think it's really important for us to recognize you know, not only are we fighting for justice on our land and protecting our homelands, but we're fighting um, for our women as well. And so I just wanted to recognize that that's a, that's a struggle that um, you know, a lot of us face daily. So um, this is gonna be the last. Um, so my email's down there, but you can't see it, so that's okay, just come up to me and say hi. But I really wanna show um, the video because I think it really gives you an idea of you know, what happened in the community, so hi, hi.